going on, folks? Welcome to another week's Live Life Wrestling Show. Sincere Hogan, that's me. Mike Marlins on the other line. What's going on, man? What's happening out there in Vegas? Well, I'm doing great, man. I'm excited <laughs> to talk to our guest today. We were just chatting with him before we started recording. Really intelligent guy, great writer. We're going to get to him in a second. But also some exciting things happening in the pipeline. One is one of my favorite bands, Madball, is coming to Vegas for the first time ever. They're cool. going to be at the Backstage Bar in Billards. And those of you that have been listening to the show for a while know that the lead singer, Freddie Madball, was on the show last year. Yep. And I've been trying to help build the hardcore underground scene out here. This is one of my side interests. And I was actually I actually contacted Madball to act as a promoter and pay for them to come out and all that jazz. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it's funny, it's halfway through the process I started to think, you know, you know what, I don't know how I don't know if this was a good idea. About, so well, welcome to my old life, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm about to just lose money, but at the same time I can't back out now because I'm gonna look like just a jack off working these guys around and these are New Yorkers. I'm from back east. We don't play that way. So I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm, just, I'm probably just going to have to pay these guys because I said I would, and then I'm probably not going to make a dime off of this. But long story short, I found I found a great venue in Vegas called the Beauty Bar, and the owner of that also is linked with the venue I just mentioned. And he's a big hardcore fan, so he just he's like, hey, do you mind me just taking over? And being the promoter and taking charge of the whole project, and I was like, "Yeah, sure." You know, I'm, as much as I would love to do this myself, you know, I'll be happy to pass it on to you because it's the best thing for the band. So it worked out great for me because I get to hang out with the guys, see the show, and I don't have to put any money down, yeah. serious money down, to back up my word. They get paid. They're doing a whole West Coast tour with a band called Strife, California Legends, hardcore band. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be coming out to Vegas. They're hitting L.A. They're hitting San Francisco. They're doing the whole Western Seaboard. So that's going to be fun. The Vegas show is on November 19th. And again, Backstage Bar and Billards over on Fremont Street, which is a really cool part of Las Vegas. (laughs) So many people come to Vegas and they just run up and down the strip. And that's fun. But if you want to see real Vegas, get over to Fremont Street. And you can even get over to the Heart Attack Grill, which is right across the street, <laughs> <laughs> where a guy, guy made a restaurant because he said, Americans are such gluttons that if I make a restaurant and call it the Heart Attack Grill, basically saying that you may have a heart attack eating this, people are going to flock to it. And they and do. Eat. And they do. <laughs> but the thing is, is he was trying to make this point to show that Americans are just driving themselves, just eating themselves to death. But at the same time, he... Makes money off of this place. Exactly. He profits off of it. Right? <laughs> He's a death merchant, man. Yeah, so it's like, okay, America. Message, but you have to shut that place down now. So, uh, he opened it up and started making so much money. He's thinking, well, God, this is, this is, I'll just make sure to have an ambulance on site. Hey, man, He's, free will, you time. know. <laughs> So anyway, that's that's some of the exciting stuff going on. Kind of makes me think about our guest today and just kind of, you know, his book and just that whole idea of free will, man. And, and okay, now that you have this knowledge, you know, what are you going to do with it? So people know what's going on. He might have read one of our our guest today's previous book, Media (laughs) Manipulation. Maybe maybe he might have applied. He probably read the first half without finishing it. He's like, hey, these are some good concepts. I'm going to put this in action. (laughs) Okay, so just some shout-outs, and then we're going to get to our guests. A lot of our listeners have been using that coupon code LLA to get 10% off the best nutrition supplements around, my product line. And we've got Audrey Powell, Jim Peters, Derek Lee, Nick Button, John Pearson, Glendon Kickpatrick, Alan Condon, James Hendershot, Lucas Hodges, Tom Oates, and Joseph Watterson. They're all using that coupon code LLA to get 10% off the Aggressive Strength Nutrition Supplement line. Many of you are waiting around for New Year's, right? We're in November right now, and you're thinking, well, the holidays are coming up, Thanksgiving's around the corner. I'll just slack off on training and nutrition, pick it up next year. Well, that's a good way to end the year with a gawk and a gunt, depending what gender you are. So if you want to avoid the gawk syndrome, and that's a scientific phrase for when your stomach is so big it merges with your sexual organ, and... Use my product EC, which is an estrogen blocker, to address that estrogen dominance. Get on aggressive strength testosterone booster, improve that testosterone to estrogen ratio. Don't just let things dissipate, right? We'll do a show, I think, sincere at some point where we talk about how to survive the holidays. Yeah, it's like why grown men look like they still have an umbilical cord. Okay, so <laughs> I was at I was at Lifetime Fitness the other day in Vegas, and I walk in the locker room, and I'm like, you know what? They should hand out every locker here should have a bottle of EC in it when the door <laughs> opens, because these are guys who are way too comfortable with their bodies. 
they need to they need to absorb those body image issues a lot of women have. <laughs> right, because <laughs> these guys need to absorb that because they're way too comfortable. Hey, look, man, they're in yeah. lifetime fitness. Okay? They're already telling you how long it's going to take them, okay? So, yeah. <laughs> guys fitness. in the mirror combing his hair with a towel over his shoulder and, a to- <laughs> and, and butt naked everywhere else. Why, why are you that comfortable? All right. <laughs> you're in a locker room full of guys. Hey, man, you got that towel, you're doing it wrong, okay? <laughs> 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 anyway, man. <laughs> All right, let's get to our. Anything yeah. else you wanted to say, man? Oh, just you know, also shouts out. You know, add Michael Ibarra to that list, and also Mike Connell, also who is also a supporter on Patreon, Patreon.com/slash LLA Podcast. People become a monthly supporter of the show by heading over there, and we truly appreciate all our supporters who already jumped on board for that. And um, yeah, it helps us bring great guests like we have today on the show. So. Yeah. So without further ado, we have. <laughs> One of my favorite authors, actually, recently, I read his book a couple times this year, and it's fantastic. It's The Obstacle is the Way, The Timeless Art of Turning Trials into Triumphs. And the author is Ryan Holiday. Ryan, how you doing today, man? Doing really good. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's good, a pleasure man. to have you on, man. I've been looking forward to talking to you all week. Just before we started recording, we were talking about how a lot of people make the mistake – of thinking in terms of what's going to make me money. It's like, I want to write a book. Let's put this in the context of the fitness business. I want to write a book on how to lose weight after pregnancy, or I want to write a book about how to improve sprinting speed. But if you don't genuinely care about these topics, whether it's going to make money or not, it's really going to be to no avail. It's not going to be a good product. You're probably not going to finish it. Writing a book is not easy. If you don't care about the theme, why would you even make it all the way through? Yeah, look, I, I, I think that's a good point. I, I see I, at least wanting to make money from something is like a tangible motivation. Right. I see What I see is even worse is people go like, oh, I'm doing a book because like all these other people I know have done a book and I figure I should have <laughs> one, right? Or we're like, hey, a lot of people are doing podcasts. Is that what I'm supposed to do now? And um, <laughs> it's like, no, you're supposed to do what you – you're supposed to do what you want to do, like what gets you excited, what gets you motivated. There's a great um, George Orwell quote where he's saying, like, you know, writing a writing a book is such a miserable experience <laughs> that if you're not driven by some some demon, you're not going to make it through. Right. And I think mm-hmm. that's true for any creative project. Stephen Pressfield he talks about this idea of the resistance. Yeah. Every creative project has its own form of resistance. You know, whether it's trying to get a six pack or trying to meet, you know, uh, meet more people and date more or it's trying to write a book. There's something that slows you down. And if you don't genuinely want what's on the other side of that, you give in. And that's where you tell yourself, oh, I was going to, but I decided not to. Or, oh, I was, but then this person screwed me over. You just come up with excuses. Right. <laughs> so you might as well not even start if if you're not genuinely motivated to do this thing. Yeah, I think you talk about that in your book, how obstacles are opportunities if you look at it that way. I think many people look at obstacles as signs to stop. So they start doing <laughs> yeah. something, some roadblock comes on, and they go, you know what? I guess it just wasn't meant to be. So I'm just going to turn the page here and move on to something else. I mean, going back to what you just said, when I decided to launch my first nutrition supplement, my testosterone booster, it was it took several years to get it out there. Like a Schwar- sure. Schwarzenegger made a point of saying, if you knew how long something would take to get done, you would never get started. Right. right? right. Like talking about all the work he had to put in to become a champion bodybuilder. He's like, man, if I knew at, before I started how much work I would have to put in, I never would have started. And I can kind of relate to that because I remember when I made the decision to do it, I was so excited about it. And I thought I would have it out in a few months at the most. But yeah. I, was, I was in uncharted territory. I'm a fitness professional, but I've never put together a supplement before. So I didn't know all the tangibles, all the intricacies of doing it. So it took a long time to finally get it out there. Now it's now it's relatively easy because I know the process. But where I'm going is that if this wasn't something that I really wanted to get out there, would have given up a long time ago never would have made it through that process now ryan do you think that's amazing because we have this instant society man everybody wants something right away everything's so microwave now and they want these quick results or you think that's like the biggest obstacle even though they think that okay well it should be easy because hey 28 days i should be able to lose all these pounds right mike <laughs> you know or to my or you know i should get like six, a, a seven figure income you know in the next 12 months that's what this guy's telling me right <laughs> Yeah, look, I think the other way to, to remind yourself when you see these sort of opportunities is like, look, 
if it was easy, everyone would do it. Right. And the, the potential rewards would reflect that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the safe stocks uh, have the least amount of sort of growth in them. Right. That's right. why they're safe. Right. Uh, but it, it's the it's it's when you sort of you head out into that uncharted territory when you do the research when you do the research you find a thing that other people maybe don't understand or they're too scared of or or whatever um, that you have the potential to reap reap the the major rewards of course like it, you know you don't want to be uh, superficial about it there's also the chance of catastrophic failure and you have to right. know that going in you have to be okay with it right um, and this is this is where sort of being objective sort of comes in like you know um neil strauss talks about this is like you know uh you walk up to a stranger in a bar the worst case scenario is they laugh at you are you okay with that um, <laughs> and if you can become okay with that then you can deal with it um right. and, and it's not going to be so bad but you've got to be really honest like what's the worst possible case scenario what's the best case scenario and then are you going to proceed with that honest understanding of the situation hopefully the answer is yes but you know for for a lot of people that the answer is no yeah yeah i mean I, I i use that just on one of my hobbies is playing blackjack and i don't go out and play with money that i'm not comfortable losing so in other sure. words i'm not i don't want to lose that money but if it happens and it does happen it's happened many times it doesn't ruin my night i'm not going to be right. dwelling on it for the rest of the week i'm not going to be kicking myself the whole <laughs> time but I think one one point you made in your book that I really liked is how when something bad happens to someone, they tend to just dwell on why is this happening to me <laughs> rather than coming up with a strategy on how to address it. And I think to put it into a, a simple context, imagine you're driving your car late at night and then you get a flat tire. So you pull off the side of the road. Now you have a couple options. One, you can get the tools out, change the tire, get on your way. Or you can just sit around and go, why is this happening? You know, just bitch moan for an hour. Uh, call up some people, complain to them about what just happened, you know, or start walking down the road. Where you call AAA I, I, and they take forever to get out there, and then you're bitching about that. Like, why is it taking so long for them to get here when you can yeah, change think, it yourself? You know, I, mean, I mean, you have to turn in your man card, though, if you call AAA. <laughs> you get tire, and the first thing you think of is, I'm going to call AAA to take care of this. You know? <laughs> that, well, that, look, that's I, that's I a sign of a much bigger a, problem. <laughs> I think there's a couple ways to look at that, and I, I think you're right for the most part. I think... <laughs> What a lot of people do in a situation, too, is, is not just like they get mad about it, they get upset, which is its own sort of pointlessness. But a lot of people will obsess about why this happened or right. what <laughs> caused it, as though understanding where you could have picked up this nail is going to have any impact <laughs> right now on that. <laughs> right, um, right. And, and, and then I think the, the other part, and this is, this is where a lot of other great writers have talked about this, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking recently, it's like, okay, so, because uh, like recently, uh, this was maybe two weeks ago, I, I go out, I, I'm got to go to a doctor's appointment. Um, I go out to my car and the car battery's dead. Um, so I'm screwed, right? I got to cancel this doctor's appointment. I'm thinking, you know, like, did my wife leave the, leave the light on? Did I leave the light on? Did I just got this car? Like, did I get screwed over? I'm thinking about all these things. But in reality, and this is what I ended up doing, the best thing to do was call AAA, go back inside, work for the next hour and a half, um, get stuff done, and then say, like, look, it was unfortunate that this thing happened and that I had to cancel this doctor's appointment. But its cost to me was relatively low because, one, I was prepared. You know, I paid to have AAA for exactly these, you know, this scenario. Sure. I, I to the best of my ability, squeezed out, you know, 90 minutes of productive work while I was waiting instead of sitting there and, you know, watching TV or playing games on my cell phone. I didn't let it ruin my day. And then I, I went back and, you know, as soon as my car could start again, salvaged as much of my pre-existing plans as possible. And then you reschedule the doctor's appointment for when you can. And so it's, it look, this when I talk about stoicism in the book, I'm not saying you got to do anything heroic. Like I'm using heroic examples in the book about a general who saves you know, uh, an army in a particularly trying time or a, a person who makes use of a prison sentence to turn their life around. But the reality is this also applies day to day. You get these minor inconveniences, you get these problems. Your life is ultimately defined by how you respond to these seemingly insignificant events. So I, I love yeah. that line, you know, how you do anything is how you do everything. So how do you respond to these little things, whether it's a flat tire getting stuck in traffic or you know, some asshole yelling at you 
over a parking space. What you do about it makes you who you are. Yeah. I think one mm-hmm. of the things, also, using the storyline you just mentioned, is that you made that time work for you. And in, in your book, you talk about Reuben Hurricane Carter, and that's what mm-hmm. he did. He made that time work for him. It was an unfair situation. He was stuck there, but he didn't let himself become institutionalized. He started. He studied law. He worked on improving himself on multiple fronts. And Malcolm X is another example. Prison sentence turned his whole life around. You could say that was one of the best things that ever happened to him. I mean, heck, right, he had yeah, a lot no, of yeah. I, I sort of talk about this as a, a Robert Greene has a great line. He calls it a live time versus dead time. You know. Mm-hmm. The, the thing that happens to you is outside your control, whether it's a lifetime or dead time, that is very much in your control. Right. Right. I mean, and now it seems like there's no reason to have any dead time. And sometimes I'll get some blood work done. You're waiting in the doctor's office for an hour. I'm not just sitting there twiddling my thumbs. I'm listening to a podcast. I'm writing an article. I'm reading a book. You're taking advantage of that time. Sure. And, and look, it's not always doing, doing, doing like uh, I like the, the other line, like it's sort of human being, not human doing. Right. You know, uh, you try to get as much done as you can, but you're also like, OK, am I going to take, you know, I'm uh, uh, th- there's a line from Marcus Aurelius where he's saying, like, uh, I have nothing to read. So I subsist on the logos and the logos <laughs> is sort of a stoic concept. Right. But what he means is like sometimes you don't have any books around. There's still ways to learn. There's still maybe you just take this second to think about your place in the world mm. and and to have a few moments of peace, right? Like right. I really like when I fly, I don't I don't I never buy Wi Fi on flights. And the reason is I want a, a minimum of an hour or however long I'm in the air to be like time when I'm disconnected. I'm, I, I know, like, this is from originally a few years ago, this was never possible. Right, right. Now it is possible. I don't have to allow this to invade my life. I can still say, like, this is a, uh, this is a moment where I'm going to have some peace. It's like, you know, they, you used to not be able to get cell phone service in the subway, now they're putting it in. You don't have to turn your phone on. Right. You can say, I'm, right. my alive time here is, is <laughs> me getting time to myself. You can choose anything. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I used to like about flying before the Wi-Fi add-on is that it was a time where no one could get in touch with you. You can't get in touch with anyone else. So right. you're forced to right. either relax for a while, watch some movies on the flight. Whatever, Read a book. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you know, those archaic <laughs> things, you know. <laughs> Talk to someone next to you for someone interesting. That happens every once in a while. Yeah. yeah. But you're forced to take a mental break from your routine because of that. Now, like you said, you can get on the Internet, but you don't have to. You don't have to make that choice because you could take the same advantages as you did before. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I'm curious is that it seems that some people are not overwhelmed by obstacles. They see these opportunities right away and they push forward. They use it to their advantage, while most seem to just get overwhelmed. Why do you think that is? Is it their life experience? Is it self-discipline? What do you think are are the primary reasons for this? Well, I guess so. Number one would be like you know maybe you're a sociopath and you don't, or you have Asperger's, you don't have the normal emotions, right? You've got so the that, Dex- Dexter complex. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a certain advantage. But I think when, when you do see someone successfully not sort of get rattled by something that might have rattled you, uh, when you dig into it, you almost always find it's a matter of experience, right? Um, uh, so, like I talk about the Apollo astronaut training in the book, uh, you know what NASA does is it it runs the astronauts through every conceivable thing they're going to experience, and they iteratively run through every part of the launch, the you know the launch proceedings. They practice you know the the missions themselves over and over and over again um, because they know that things are going to go wrong, and they want to free up as much mental energy as possible to focus on those things. Mm rather than being caught off guard by them or unprepared or or unable to deal with them. And so, yeah. you know, I think about it, it's like the first time you get dumped, it's the worst thing in the world. The <laughs> second time you get dumped, it's not as bad, because at least you know you're probably going to survive. The third right? time you look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fourth, fourth time you're the one right. dumping someone third else. Third <laughs> time you never for another relationship ever again. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but it, it's experience. The more you expose yourself to things, the more you're going to be able to be prepared to deal with them. And so I think, you know, it, it's like when bad stuff happens, the the if you're looking for just a really simple way to derive even the slightest bit of benefit from it, you can just tell yourself, well, at least I have some experience dealing with this now, right? At least I've 
at least at the end of this, no matter how unpleasant it's going to be, I'll be able to say, I did that, right? I went through that. It, at the very least, I'm getting a story or a little bit of perspective out of it. And, yeah. and that's how you that's how you deal with the crap that life throws at you. I think that that was come from just, you know, one thing about having those experiences is like you now have knowledge. You have intel. This is no different probably than what our military guys go through or whatever. Right. The more and more intel you gather, the more you experience with it. So the, the less you have to fear. Most fear comes from what you don't know. Right. And that's right. what hurts people. And that's what, that's what stops people in their tracks when they start trying to start a new project, write a book or whatever else and start a new business is the fact that they don't know if it's going to succeed or fail. They have, a lot of times they have no idea if this is going to work. And just the idea of not knowing scares the crap out of people. And even when you start talking about dating and relationships, it's like when that guy sees that hot chick at the bar, you know, he's just like, okay, would she be interested in me? Do I have everything that she's looking for? You don't know, dude, until you go up and ask her. And you, like we were saying earlier, the worst that can happen, she says no. And the more and more no's you get, the more confident a lot of guys get. You know, Mike and I have talked about this before. So and that's, then you get, to a, you get to a place where you're like, damn right, she'll be interested. In that, <laughs> exactly. right? that's, that's the place you want to get. And then you turn it on her. Life experience because <laughs> once, once you have a certain amount of life experience and success in certain yeah. arenas, you have a clear idea of who you are, right? And that yeah. comes, and so you have natural confidence. You're not faking it. A lot of people, it's fake confidence. It's bravado. And, that, and that's why a lot of women experience buffoons coming up with moronic <laughs> right. lines, right? Because that's that's you know, that's the best they can come up with at that moment. When you have more confidence, then you're more like in Ricardo Montalban mode, right? You're just smooth, you know, in your own way. You don't have to act like him. You're just smooth in your own way. And then, it, then, it, then I think it's a paradigm shift. It's like, why wouldn't she be interested in me? Exactly. Yeah. It's like, then you walk away like, well, you're lost. I'm, I'm actually a good-ass guy. So, well, well. <laughs> deal with the jerks for the rest of the night. Why don't you? One of the things in, in your book, Ryan, that made me crack up is like you said, when you're intimidated by someone, just imagine that person having sex. <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, just imagine them going through the motions, the grunting, the groaning. You know? it's, 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 you're not going to be intimidated anymore. And, you know, I don't know if you're not going to be intimidated anymore, but you're going to get a good laugh out of that. That's for sure. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, look, that's the other benefit of experience is the more successful people you meet, the more famous people you meet, the more you know accomplished people you meet, whatever yeah. you realize, they're just regular people. Absolutely. Who, who, accomplish something and right. the thing doesn't say anything about them as a person and it, and it won't it likely won't say anything about you as a person either so right. how can you uh how, how can you how can you expose yourself to those things so these these sort of intimidating factors no longer sort of hover over you and make you feel crappy that that's what you're aiming for yeah absolutely and i like what you said about I mean, one of the things one of the things I really liked about your book is the fact that you're very upfront about obstacles can be beneficial. A lot of the hardships that we look at as negatives can actually be assets, and I think that's a good paradigm shift for a lot of people to have. Because I think when some people come from destitute environments or they're they're stuck in a dead end job, they they look at these as insurmountable obstacles. But in essence, if you frame it the right way, you can turn this whole thing around. And it reminds me of when I was just doing jobs I hated before I got into what I'm doing now. And I just felt like I was going nowhere. And then the best thing ever happened to me is I got fired from one of these jobs. And when I'd gotten fired previously, I always looked at that as a negative thing. Like, oh, great. What am I going to do now? I don't have money coming in. But this time around, I didn't have any fear whatsoever. I go, finally, I can just go after what I want to do. And then you start having all these negative energies start coming in. You start. The, I think the mistake a lot of people make early on is when you decide to do something new, you start telling people about it. And this is before you've started the process, right? Right. So you like you tell your parents, "Hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to go teach kettlebells in the park, make a good living doing that, or I'm going to be a fitness professional." And people around you are like, "That's not going to fucking work. There's, there's no way that's going to work." Get a and real you job. Just get, you get bombarded <laughs> with all this negativity. And I, I heard in an interview somewhere where you said that you don't talk about a new book you're working on until you're almost done with it. And is that for similar reasons? Is it because totally. you don't want to dissipate energy or you just don't want the negativity? It's it's all of those things. So on the yeah. one, it's I never like giving myself credit for something until I've earned it, right? It's real easy to tell people what you're going to do. It's right, harder right. to go fucking do it, right? Right, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and I, so I think that's a big part of it. Um, I think a, a big part of it is, you know, a, a project is intimidating and there's – um, we're always looking for excuses not to do it. And so in some ways, telling other people is a nice way to open yourself up to discouragement and criticism, which isn't going to be help, 
be helpful. So I think that's a big that's a big part of it for me. Um, so I, I'm I'm trying to focus inwards, focus on what I have to do, not give a shit about what other people think until sort of well, not really ever, but but until until I've done the work and I'm proud of what I've done, and then I can say this is this is what I've been working on. What do you think? Right. Now, how do you how does how do you encourage someone to turn to see it, an obstacle as an opportunity? I think that's the hardest part. A lot of times in hindsight, I can see, OK, that was an opportunity. But when it's happening, I think it's easy to just blow the problem out of proportion, make it bigger than it is, but also just get stuck in that over analyzation mode or over research mode. So you don't move forward with anything. Sure. Look, I think it's a matter of perspective. I mean, just just what you just did there is a nice way to think about your problems. It's like think back to the worst thing that ever happened to you. Um, is it less bad in retrospect? Almost always, yes. Um, in many cases, people go like, "Yeah, it was bad, but it made me who I am. It put me on the path that I am on today." And then, if you ask them, "Would you trade that thing? Hmm. Would you?" It, it, would you choose for that not to happen? Most of the people would say, like, no, I, I mean, it was instrumental in my life. So I think that's a big part of it. The yeah. other part I like to say is uh, there's like that old saying where it's like, um, you know, put all your put all your prob. If everyone came together, put your problems in the center of a circle um, and you could pick anyone else's problems. <laughs> most people will take their problem. Back. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> And, and that, like, I like to think about whatever you're struggling with right now. Chances are there's thousands of people who would gladly tra- trade places with you right now. No doubt. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like Obama must. Obama <laughs> probably thinks on, on when he's having the worst day in the world. Right? He's got to think there are some of the most powerful people in the world right now spending millions of dollars to fight to have what I have right now, right? So, like, you want to think about all the people who are, who, who would gladly take what you have uh, because, not just because it motivates you, but to realize, like, hey, this thing that I think is so bad is actually a problem born out of success or abundance or luxury or whatever. What I'm dealing with, as unpleasant as it is, um, is pro is almost certainly a first world problem, and no and that can help you from getting too distraught over it. Yeah, yes. I, just have, I have a phrase where I talk about I go, is it a real problem or a luxury problem? Right. right. And most of the things that we call luxury problems in the developed world are inconveniences. It's yeah. Really, like getting a flat tire is not a real problem; it's an inconvenience. It's, it's my, not a know, life or death situation. Exactly. A child born with cancer that's a real problem. Right. You know, you know, the parents dealing with that, that's a real problem. And that's why, you know, one of my friends say, we well, just go to a cancer ward. If you ever feel like you're depressed and because things right. are not going your way, you know, go to a children's hospital and then rethink that. And I'm pretty yeah. sure you'll walk around, you know what? <laughs> what am I but bitching even, about? Even in that example, right? Like <laughs> right. how many parents of kids who were, who, who were miscarried or died at mm-hmm. birth would gladly trade to have a kid who had cancer, right? Mm-hmm. Like e- even the worst problems yeah. in the world. There's probably someone who's experiencing experiencing an even worse problem who's looking at you with a vague sense of jealousy or envy. Yeah, and right. Like, I, I think, look, this doesn't magically solve whatever you're going through, but it can prevent you from sort of going too far down that rabbit hole of, of pity and despair. And, yeah. give you the, and give you a wake up call, like, okay, you know what? So, what are you going to do about it? So, bitching about it and, you know, oh, this is really, this right. really sucks. It's like, okay, it sucks. Now what? And, and that's exactly. the, so that's the next step yeah, right there. Complaining has to lead to action at some point. Exactly. Right? Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels. I think the mistake a lot of people make is they get a payoff in the complaining stage. So sure. it, it, it's like a lot of people get power from others by talking about their problems. So it's like as long as they have problems, they feel important. It's like I'm going to call up so-and-so <laughs> and tell him about this, and he's going to say, oh, that's so bad. Sorry to hear that, blah, blah, blah. And then that becomes a vicious cycle. It's addictive. Exactly. Like, look what yeah, I'm going through. There's look a sign in the Patriots <laughs> locker room where it's like uh, losers get together in little groups and complain about things <laughs> and get things done. You know, and, and that's what happens. It's like you can get together with your friends and bitch about how unfair or unfortunate everything is, or you can try to solve it. Yeah, it goes back to those phrases like misery loves company. 
You know, and, uh-huh. and that's so true. You know, people are like, oh shit, you're bitching? Hey, let me jump in. I got some stuff to bitch about too. <laughs> it's like a right. bitch so collect we'll just, plate. Just go to, just go to, and it just go to any bar on any night. Well, that's what it's set there's up there for. Be, there's going to be people that are just drinking, having a good time, and then there's going to be people that are like, yeah, my life sucks. My job sucks. My wife's a bitch, so I'm here drinking a lot. But that's not solving anything, right? Yeah, you think your job sucks, dude? It's like, try being the bartender listening to you right now. <laughs> it's like, so he hears that all yeah. day long. <laughs> no, but like you said in your book, Ryan, you talk about how the, the, the things can always be worse, as, as you mm-hmm. just mentioned now. For example, in, the, in your book, you give the example of, I, I lost all this money on a business. Okay, well, you could have lost your leg or your arm. You could have lost your eyesight. Right? right? So like, no matter how bad things are, it could always be a lot worse. So in sure. some ways, you say, okay, if this is the worst case scenario, I can deal with this. And let's rise like a phoenix from this situation. Exactly. Yeah, look, I mean, it sounds a little depressing, but it's actually kind of liberating if you think about it. It's like, no, this could be a lot worse. Like, it seems really bad, <laughs> but it could be. It doesn't require that creative of a mind to think of a much worse scenario. And so you can you can be mad about what you got or what you didn't get, or you can focus on the fact that, you know, you were spared – this much worse problem and which frame of of looking at the world is going to be most conducive to sort of successful action i mean just do like kim jong every time you have an issue and it could have been worse just think about the hangover but did you die and then yeah. like oh okay never mind let me move on so if you just add that to every problem that you have did you die and right. then that means well if you if you can actually answer that question that means you have a chance to fix it okay so right. and that's really that simple you know well, you might pre- you might prefer that scenario than being Adebisi's roommate in the office, right? <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, like or in the Hangover, you, you discover the, worse than the, death, the unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, Hangover too, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then you actually, I wish I had died. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was I a like girl. Talk about a lot, other thing I like in your book, Ryan, is you talk about focusing on what you can control, and you were you were discussing that a little bit earlier, where there are so many things out of our control, and we can dwell on those things, but those things are out of our control. So you right. can't do anything about it. There's really no point dwelling on it. But there's always something you can do in every situation, right? There's some proactive action you can take, and that's where your focus should be. But it seems like that is difficult to do even when you're used to doing it. Sometimes it's easy to say it now, right, as we're talking. But when you're in that situation, it's not always easy to see that because you have either, either from the amount of sheer stress that's happening, which just gives you this tunnel vision, or, or you're just you, you just don't know where to go. Sure, look, so, I mean, it's it's easy to say all of this stuff. It's harder right, to right. do it. It's harder right. to do it every single day, of course. Um, I, I think, look, uh, the serenity prayer that alco- that they, they practice in Alcoholics Anonymous mm-hmm. is, you know, the sort of the the wisdom to know the things I can change, um, the cur- the courage to to to, to, to face change. the things I can, right? right, right. And and the the thinking there is. Um, you can waste a lot of time and energy focused on the things you can't change. And that is well and good, but let's not confuse that time and energy uh, spent on... uh, Let's not confuse that with effort towards alleviating the problem, right? And and so I think it's like, let's say you've got some impossible... like Let's say you've got some very exceedingly difficult task um, that's going to require every ounce of energy you have to do it right. So it's like, look, if you got to run a marathon, you don't get up in the morning and go for a long bike ride, right? You, right. you, you conserve <laughs> your energy for the problem at hand. Yeah. And uh, I think you know a lot. What a lot of people do is exhaust themselves with these other intangible, unchangeable things before they actually get around to focusing on the the thing that they need to do. Yeah. yeah, which I takes to the third part of that. Uh, go ahead. No, I'm saying which leads us to the third part of that serenity prayer is like having the wisdom to know the difference. Exactly. <laughs> you know? And that's the part they kind of leave out. It's just like, oh, let me just do something else. And it's like, no, you should know that that that's not going to work. That's a distraction. <laughs> that's a distraction. So I think people overwhelm <laughs> themselves too with focusing on the destination, right? And just a, <laughs> a lesser example, but still relevant. Would be I like to do a lot of sprinting a couple times a week. And let's say I do 12 all out 100 yard dashes. Now. After you do the first 100-yard dash, you're huffing and puffing if you pushed it hard. So if you start thinking, okay, 11 more to go, you're going to mentally break at that point. I'll just skip rope. So, so my, my advice <laughs> yeah. to people is always one at a time. Do yeah. that first one. Okay, now, number two. Now, focus on number three. 
know, you don't focus on number 12. If you're going to do a thousand Hindu squats, you don't, you don't go, okay, after the first one, 999 more to go. <laughs> you know, that's just going to be mentally right. depressing. So, so much of physical training is mental. I always say that when you do these sprinting, let's say the first five or six runs are your conditioning, your fitness level. If you don't have a good fitness level conditioning, you're not going to get through the first five, six runs. After that, though, it's primarily mental. Because uh-huh. your brain just says, hey, you just did enough. You know, six is good. You can leave it at this. No need to push yourself. It's five more than most people. You do seven. <laughs> just stop here. Just stop here. So, so you, have to have this, you have to have this attitude of I'm not leaving this field until I get the 12, 13, whatever the number is you're trying to go for. And like UFC Matt Brown made a point. He goes, a lot of people say running is useless for UFC fighters. You just go for a jog. He's like, you, if, it's like, if it doesn't suck, it's useless. You know, it should be hard, so you're actually developing conditioning that's relevant to the sport. If you're just going for a little quick casual jog, that's not going to be useful. It's boring, and it's not going to be useful for what you're trying to do. So I think, I think the mental side of things with physical training is so paramount, and it's, it's the same thing with anything else, though, with the business. A lot of times people just overwhelm themselves. They get started in a training business, and they have this goal of, I need to make this much this year. It's like, well, why don't you have a goal of just still being in business by the end of the year? Sure. You know, <laughs> have a goal of – or like on Shark Tank. Right? We talk about Shark Tank, the TV show all the time, where people have these good incomes already. But then they they just get impatient. So they're coming on the show. They want to get investors. They want to blow this thing out of proportion. They have one location in New York City, which is not even profitable <laughs> yet. And now they want to open up three others across the country when they haven't proven one is viable yet. So I think sometimes people just have to slow it down. You know, just focus on one step at a time, break it into chunks, and then just gradually build it up into the larger picture. Sure. No, look, that's the process. It's it's one step at a time. It's uh, Nick Saban, the, the the coach at Alabama. This is what mm-hmm. he does, right? He's like, look, the average down lasts seven seconds, right? Right. Yeah. So don't focus on the whole game. Why don't you just focus on getting it right for seven seconds? You, mm. you can handle that. Like, can you be excellent for seven seconds? Can right. You do- <laughs> Your job, the job we've practiced for you to do, can you do that perfectly right for seven seconds? If you can do that each time, we're going to win. Yeah, it's like, Al, it's like Al, Al Pacino's speech in Any Given Sunday, right? I love that speech where he just talks football is a game of inches. Just one inch at a time. We're just going to fight for each inch. Right. And look, if you don't, if you, if you, if you, you do every down perfectly and you don't win, at the very least, you know there was literally nothing else you could have done. Yeah, that's what, yeah. That's what it's about, about, leaving everything on the table, you know. And even when you talk about those seconds, just think of like a bull rider. That dude's got eight seconds. You think he's thinking about the next bull or, you know, and, oh, I can't wait. I'm on the ground. I'm walking back into the, you know, back through the gate. He's thinking like, nah, dude, I'm trying to stay my behind on this bull for eight seconds and not get flipped off and, and not get hit in the ass with a horn or something like that. So he doesn't have he doesn't have the luxury of thinking about what's going to happen nine seconds from now. So all no, he can do no, is think- those eight seconds are very long for him. They, exactly. Right, they are themselves right. broken up into smaller chunks, right? He's yeah. like, look, for, can I get from zero to one? Can I get from one to two? Can I get from two to three? And that, that's that's the same for all of us. Yeah. Well, I think I think a lot of people under, are just hypnotized by a lot of the self help nonsense, right? Where they think that if they take enough seminars, if they need a, enough books, they can go from point A to point B without any problems, without any obstacles. So I think that's what a lot of people have bought into where they're thinking is like if if I just do enough research, I'm not going to have all these problems other people before me had. And it reminds me of when I used to train over at Mark Phillippe's gym. He's a top strength coach here in Vegas. And anytime I would go into a heavy lift, he's like, look, don't go into this thinking it's going to be easy. Right. A, lot, a lot of times I would go into a heavy lift going, okay, this should be easy for me, and then it wouldn't be, and I would just mentally stop right there. He goes, no, you just like, go into this thinking it's going to be hard. That way when it's easy, you'll be pleasantly surprised, but if it's hard, you're not going to give up. You're not going to just cave. And, no, I was, look, that's a, that's and how a, motivating you know, is that anyway? Right. That's, that's sort of what I wanted the book to be about. It's like, look, it's not going to be easy. Shit's going to go wrong, and uh, if you can be ready for that and uh, you can be prepared, you're going you're gonna to be able to handle it, and if you can't, it's going to be – unnecessarily harder and just on, let's be honest though you actually want to do it or not i think is what it really comes down to right it's like when yeah. you say like i want to do this it's like okay we're gonna find out 
you know, when you get this process going and several obstacles come your way, whether it's a fitness goal or a business goal, whatever it is, you're going to find out whether you want to do it or not. And most people realize, you know what? I guess I really don't want to do this. And then they quit. Well, let me just be honest. If it, if it was easy every freaking time, how motivating is that for anyone in the first place? Right, right. You know, because one thing about it, we're rebellious by nature. So when something's sitting there and it's not working, you know, it's a natural instinct like, F that, you can't tell me I can't do this. You know, why the hell is this not working? You want to tinker with it. That's a natural instinct to want. Right. It's just, it's called evolution. So just think of your cells that thought about that thousands of years ago, like, crap. You know, it's kind of hard splitting into, an, into another cell. This sucks. We'd all still be amoeba right now. <laughs> you know, so there's, it's just, it's in your blueprint to want to rebel and want to try and keep going and keep going and not just give up right off the bat. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be here. You know? only, the only flip side <laughs> to that, Ryan, and I'm curious what you have to say about this, is sometimes people unnecessarily create obstacles in order <laughs> to have more difficulty because that somehow makes them feel more important. So, for example, they may run a business inefficiently. So that they have to waste more time on it, <laughs> you know, than running it really efficiently where they have way more free time, but they don't know what to do with that free time. So now that's a problem. Yeah, yeah look, I think I think a lot of people make up a lot of excuses because they know it's going to be hard and they know the results are not certain and they make up excuses. So so they don't have to objectively face that. Right. So they yeah. don't have yeah. to deal with whatever judgment is inherent in the results. And And I think if you can get over that. You find that success is less intimidating. You find that that failure is less intimidating, and and you sort of uh, you go from there. Yeah, I was listening to someone's lecture where he said about 95% of research is just procrastination. <laughs> and that, that's, that's, that's been my experience too. And I talk about research addicts and action addicts. You know, action, action addicts don't do any research. They're very impulsive. They don't have any strategy. They just throw stuff out there. And hopefully it works. Most of the time it doesn't because they don't have any clue what they're doing. But then the flip side of that are people that are going, I just, I just, I just need to read a few more books. I need to take a <laughs> class now. Like I knew this one girl who took a, a nutrition course and then I was like, okay, you ready to start your business? She's like, well, I, I think I need to take a business marketing class now. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, and then she took that and she still hasn't got anything going on because <laughs> it, it's easy to just keep going down that road of, I just need to know a little bit more. Just one more thing. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Well, look, look, guys, this has been amazing. I sort of got to run, but oh, no problem, uh, no problem, no problem. Where, where can, yeah, no problem. Where, where can people find out more about your stuff, Ryan? Uh, so my website's ryanholiday.net, and then uh, the book is The Obstacles Away, which they can buy anywhere. And uh, I, I would love to hear what they think. Sounds good. Awesome, hey, man. Hey, we appreciate your time, man. Thanks amazing. This is really fun. All right, Thank thanks you, a lot, man. Have a good day, All right. buddy. Bye. Take care. And again, that's our guest, Ryan Holiday. His book, The Obstacle Is the Way. Definitely check it out. It's not a long read. You can get through it pretty quickly. It's going to be somewhat of a sobering read for a lot of people, <laughs> I think, though, because it's not. But I think in a lot of ways it's going to be a refreshing read because right. so many of us have read these books where it's all just have a positive attitude. You got this. You can do anything and yeah. da 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 da. And, <laughs> and I, I think it's important to realize that anything you want to do that's meaningful is going to be difficult. But that's not a bad thing because you really find out who you are. During arduous situations right. when things are tough, like you said, sincere. I mean, if you're doing a workout, every time you work out, it's easy. That's not really that satisfying. No. But at the same, but at the same time, you don't want to do workouts where you purposely make it difficult. For example, by using poor technique, so now that your body's more beat up than it should be, or you just compress things too much, so right. that you're you're artificially fatigued, so that you feel like, <laughs> oh, I'm so wiped out from that. It was a good workout. <laughs> which is pretty much the state of the industry for the most part now. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, let me just let me just go and have my ass handed to me. Okay, but what was the goal? The real right. goal. And it's like, right. no, to have my ass handed to me. Like, oh, <laughs> we, I mean, don't you get enough of that in, at work or, you know, in relationships? And maybe that's another thing that that's another reason some of these folks look for that, you know, in the gym because it's happening in other aspects of their life. So, like, yeah. they get their ass handed to them by their boss every day, you know, right. or their co workers and, you know, or their, their spouse or their kids. And so, just like, well, what, why, why should the gym be any different? I mean, this is my life, this is normal. And right. so it's like, well, damn, now, that, now that's sobering right there. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Forget the book. That's sobering. That's yeah. a sobering. I'm like, well, well shit, well, just man. Kind of one of the points Ryan brought up where he talked about, where we were talking about, just get the process going before you start telling everyone about it. Right. You know, when you're getting close to the end, tell them about it. And that reminds me of, of just launching any product where a mistake a lot of companies make is you do pre-orders. And yeah. that's always going to be a disaster. You should only do a pre-order if you actually have it in stock, right? You're using, you're doing a pre-order as a marketing method. Yeah, right, right. But the product is actually in stock. You're not like, okay, it should be in stock this date. And then for some reason there's 
an extra six month delay and now you have a thousand people emailing you going, when's this product coming out? I ordered it here. You said it was going to be available this right. day. Pre-orders are always a disaster. <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm coming out with my new adrenal energy product, Red, and people, I've had a couple of people hit me up going, hey, are you going to take pre-orders? I'm like, man, I just sent the check to get this production going. <laughs> now, it could be ready in as short as six weeks, but most likely it's going to be eight, ten weeks. Definitely within three months it should be ready unless some problem comes up. But that could happen, right? Right. So that's why there's no way I would do pre-orders right now. There's no way in hell I would do it, it is a, Like I said, um, it is a nightmare. Like when I was telling you last week about uh, one of the Kickstarter projects for the Rock Grinder. You know, right. this is like – this is a badass grind. I got mine finally yesterday. And this grinder, this this coffee grinder dude, his hand grinder is like so fucking badass. And I'm going to take pictures of him, post it up or whatever. And again – this has been a year's process, but, you know, I understood it. So I'm not the person that's going to sit there and badger them the entire time, you know, and they're keeping people up to date of what's going on with the project. But you, you're dealing with something where these guys are in Australia. Of course, they're dealing with manufacturers in China, you know, and and then you're dealing with distributors in America, you know, here in the U.S. So you got all these channels where you pretty much it's global channels and a lot of time zones to be covered when you're discussing, when you're talking to these people. So. I got it. But, you know, there are people who just just regular consumers who don't have businesses. They don't understand this whole process of running a business, especially being a startup and coming out with a, a unique product and all the headaches that come along with that. They're right. mainly they're bitching and they're badgering, they're emailing, whatever else. But the one thing I did like about these guys is the fact that they even addressed that and put that in the update. That like some of you yeah. guys are bitching and complaining, you know, about this, 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 even though we've kept you up to date and we told you, you know, all the process or whatever. So, you know, it's it's going out now. You know, yeah. if you're in Australia, yours is going out this week. You know, in the U.S., yours is going out in two weeks, and all you have to do is just confirm your address, blah, 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 blah. Yet and still, people will still find a reason to complain. There were still people bitching like, well, you know, um, so you said in a few days. Yeah, a few days. That's three. You know, like, you know, I went to me. I went to my mailbox the next day. I didn't see it. Dude, do you know what a few <laughs> do you know what a few is? OK, do we have to break that down to my tomorrow and a few are two different things here. So. Again, I can see where the nightmare of that is, but when people go into something, especially like a Kickstarter campaign or something like that, don't expect something right away. Right. You know, you're, you're early adapters. If anything, you're, you're paying to beta test yeah, almost exactly. to the point, you know, that you're, you're investing in an idea. You're not actually investing in a product yet. You're, you're, in, you're just investing in a concept that, you know, hopefully is going to come into fruition. And, yeah. and you got to understand it. So again, a lot of people who've never invested in anything, these are people who will probably never buy a stock. They'll probably never right. start a business. They're going to be the main ones complaining. Guys like us, we get it. We get it. It's like, yeah, I know this is going to be a while, but here's what I'm thinking. I don't care how long it really takes. I just want to make sure that I have a nice functioning product that I paid for. You know, and, and, it, and it delivers on all the things you said that you guys are going to put into this and make it unique. Because that's what I bought into, your idea. So yeah. that's thinking like an investor, thinking like an entrepreneur, thinking, thinking in terms of a creative. Because you, you realize that those are all the things that go into that. So it can be a nightmare, man. You know, when you're dealing with people who are not like-minded and you take that chance, though. It's like, so what's the, be what's the alternative? You know what? Raise your own capital on your own and put your money into it. Don't have a bunch of strangers investing in your idea because then they feel like they have a vote. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the yeah. that's a big headache to any of you entrepreneurs out there, any creatives out there. That's the issue. That's kind of one of the issues we always talk about when we talk about Shark Tank and all that. It's like you're now inviting people. You're giving people opportunities to invest in the real estate of your mind. And you got to understand, that's your real estate. Don't share that with other people, man, because they don't see it the way that you do. They're not going to care for it the way that you do. Just like anyone that owns a business, your employees don't give a shit about your, your business the way you do. So you can't get upset when things are not going 100% the yeah, way that there, you see there's it. There's no reason why they should. Exactly. Right? It's not their company. It's a they're, job they're for them. <laughs> they get fired or they leave, they'll go to another job. Right. So, I mean, you can't expect someone who's an employee to care about your business as much as you do. Right. So that, that, was, that was always a laughable point when I worked for other companies where <laughs> people at the top would be like, oh, man, this person doesn't care about this. I was like, yeah, they're a hired gun. Man. <laughs> you know, it's not their baby. They don't yeah. care about it as much as you. They're not going to. They're not going to spend the weekend here in the office working all night like you will because it's your business. So, yeah, they're, they're basically a time and work mercenary. 
Okay, <laughs> that's what they are. They're there to kill time in your name. They're trading time for money. So exactly. When, so when you're no longer giving them money for time, you know, they're going to take their time somewhere else. You know? Exactly. It's just that <laughs> so simple. So it's like, I work not to five. It's like, oh, can you stick around for a few hours? Can you I pay said, me? Nope. No, then I'm nope. out of here. Nope. <laughs> what did Kanye say? Fuck you, pay me. Okay. <laughs> but when you run your own business, yeah. you're going you're gonna to be putting in a lot of time that – it's yeah. not that, that you're not monetizing, right? Like when I'm researching stuff, I'm, no one's paying me to do that. When I'm writing ad copy for a product, of my own product, I'm not getting paid to do it. It's but all it, leading to something that'll pay it, me. Exactly. So you're, you're, you're investing, you're putting in that sweat equity or whatever. You're, you're making those deposits or whatever, then hopefully it's going to pay off in right. the end. You know, but right. the thing is, you're not, so, you're not already thinking like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make all this just if I start doing this right now. I'm going to make this right. amount of money. Like, you don't know that. Who are, who are you? Miss Cleo? You, you're predicting the future <laughs> now? What are you doing? And we see how that worked out for her. <laughs> okay, so. Well, I think that's the other mistake people make is just being too overly attached to results, right? They yeah, think, yeah. I'm going to get started. Here's what is going to happen. Happens that you don't know what's going to happen, but if you immerse yourself completely in the process, you focus on excellence in the process stage, most likely you're going to be really happy with the result. And we can put that in the context of working out, right? Yeah. Like if you put in, if you have a 12 week program you're on, and you have a, you have an idea where you, you have a direction where you want to go, it's important to have goals. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a goal, I'm not mm-hmm. saying you should just go to the gym and just work out. You want to have a goal, but you don't want to be so focused on that goal that you don't put in excellence on each workout that's leading to that goal. So week right. after week, you're just working on technique. You're hitting all the numbers. You're, you're dialing in performance. You're going to be pretty happy with where you are at the end of that 12-week program. I've been doing a, a deadlift program that I got off TNation.com. I forget the author's name. I'll find it. I'll find it, and we can talk about it on, on another episode after I've completed it. But I'm on, I think, week six now. And I'm is that, really the, one that, you, is that the one that you sent me uh, yeah, a couple yeah, weeks ago? It you. It's, yeah, it's It's basically a program where you do five sets of five with a certain percentage of your one rep max. Then you do five sets of three, five sets of one, and then you take a week off. And then the next phase, it's four sets of five, heavier weights, four sets of five, four sets of three, four sets of one, week off. And then you go heavier three sets of five, three sets of three, three sets of one, et cetera. So you get the idea. As, as the intensity goes up, the volume goes down. Matt Kroc, I think that's the one yeah, you Yeah, Matt Kroc, that's yeah. right. Right. It's a great program. And the key, though, is to actually follow it. <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> after that, after you finish the first three weeks, you're not going to want to take that week off. You're going to be thinking, I don't need to take that week off. Let me just go right into the next phase. Right. It's like, nah, you take the week off, you're going to be even stronger. Or you're gonna think, oh, this this week was too easy. Let me just increase add, the weight. Yeah, let me add a little phase, more. Right? <laughs> it's like it's supposed to be easy that first phase because you're just getting used to the program. You're dialing in technique. I can't, I can't emphasize enough how important optimal technique is on any exercise, but in particular the deadlift. Deadlift, yeah. Now you mm-hmm. could you can always improve technique. I'm always looking at clips online on YouTube or somewhere, mm-hmm. just looking at how different lifters perform, and I and I and I always pick up something a little bit different. That helps out a lot. And my deadlift technique now, I feel like I'm really in the pocket. You know, I had a really great workout this past weekend. Technique felt really good. Not only did I feel strong, but my body felt really good afterwards, meaning I didn't have that back stiffness or anything like that. Right. So that's when you know you're in the pocket. Every rep felt good. And it's funny because I was doing my top set <laughs> at five reps, and I was, yeah. and the first three reps were easy. Yeah. And I started thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I can't believe how easy this is. And then rep four was easy. Then all of a sudden I got out of the pocket because I was so I was so focused on how easy it was. I got out of the pocket and then rep five was harder than it should be. And I stopped right there. Right. Because that's where you're prone to injury. So it just reminded me of what Mark Phillippe said, you know, go into it as if it's going to be difficult. But sometimes you have a tendency to get overconfident in the middle of a set, right. which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. You go in focused, like, OK, I'm focused. And then you're like, wow, that was super easy. And then all of a sudden it gets really hard. You know? And then you're like, what? Well, you're like, what just happened? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, what? What just happened in that split second, one rep ago? You know that this started to happen. Well, we see that happen in fights, right? Like in the yeah. UFCs. Like oh an yeah. Opponent, an, an opponent tags somebody in the first He's, minute. They're like, like, man, I can't believe I fucking tagged them. And the guy's dazed. And then they they either pull back or they get overconfident, and then they get then they get clipped. And the fight's over. We see that happen all the time. I mean, the classic is always Anderson Silva and Chael Sonnen. It's like all the way five rounds, and you've gone pretty much 24 minutes and 54 seconds. And all of a sudden, all you had to do was hold on for about six more seconds, and dude, you would have been a champion. But why are you tapping out? And you knew. You heard the click for 10 seconds. You know 10 more seconds, I can be champ. 
you know, right. what went wrong in the next four seconds that made you tap out that you couldn't hold yeah. on for six more seconds. You know, that's the thing about it. You, so you're probably thinking like, I got this. I'm good now. And just for that split second, he's like, no, nah, you don't. Well, even, in the, <laughs> even in the rematch, he dominated Anderson in yeah. the first round. And in the second round, he made a mistake. Anderson kicked it. Yep. Bam, it was over. Game over. But, but it was a mistake he made. It wasn't yep. a mistake that Anderson caused him to make. Right. So it was, it was another situation where, in some ways, that was even more tragic. Which is another like, kind of attachment type thing. It's like, okay, I'm dominating him in the first round. I'm going to do this again. And, this, you know, again, it could well, have I mean, been I think the problem is, is like once, once, you say, <laughs> once you say to yourself, oh, I can't believe how easy this is, guess what? You loosen up a little bit. You uh -huh. get too comfortable. You get too comfortable, and all of a sudden, now you're prone to injury. Right. So I think that's an important point to make when you're trying to achieve anything meaningful or pursuing success. Once you start getting comfortable, like Daniel Coyle said, who's been on our show, first year we did it, author mm -hmm. of The Talent Code, he said that comfort is a narcotic. <laughs> yeah. And it really is. It, makes, it starts <laughs> making you soft, right? You start, you start, your guard comes down, you're out of the pocket now, and now you're more prone to failure. Yeah, there are a lot of addicts walking around, and it's not just from their training. There's a lot of addicts who are addicted to comfort. <laughs> you know, yeah. So. Well, it's easy to get in there because sometimes there's there's the entrepreneur's paradox, right? Where like mm -hmm. you put everything on the line, you grind it hard, and you became successful. Now you have to do it again yeah. to get to the next level. Now you got to put it all on the line again. But now you have a lot more to put on the line because you're actually successful. When you started off, you put it all on the line, but you didn't really have that much, right? <laughs> right. So, I mean, you're putting it all in on the line. In your mind, you're like, I really don't have that much to lose this time. It's like, oh, this is my first time. If it goes and wrong, you really eh. don't because you don't have that much. Like when I first started my business, like, yeah, I put it all on the line, but I didn't really have that much at that time. So right. it, wasn't, it wasn't the worst thing in the world if I lost that. I have a lot more now, and I don't have to put everything I have on the line. But when you're pursuing bigger goals, you're putting there's more. You got to take bigger risk. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So there's there's this voice in your head that says, oh, you don't have to just don't do anything. Just coast where you are right now. Yeah, exactly. You know, avoid <laughs> risks. Just stay comfortable. But that's not fulfilling. That's you're, you're you lose the spirit of what got you successful in the first place. You're forgetting, hey, that intensity, that fire, that not being risk adverse is what got me here. So if I want to keep moving forward, I have to dip back into those waters again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. Same thing with training, right? It's like you you work up to, I mean, you you have to push yourself in training, and then it gets to a point where you've achieved a certain level of strength, and you can just coast there. But if you want to go up to the next level, now you're going to have to dip back into those hard waters. And then you start thinking like, well. Why am I going back here feeling weak again? You know, when you start something, you know, new and a new and a new objective with your training. Why do I want to feel like I'm this weak guy? I, I'm stronger than this. And then you start going back to that. I want to go back to doing the things I felt like I was stronger. But then you, it's relative. Strength is relative. We were just talking about yeah, this yeah. yesterday at my gym. Is just like, yeah, but you're strong at at that certain level that you made it to. But here's the deal. That's only going to take you so far. And some people, are, they're happy with that. Well, they think they're happy with it. They're not exactly happy. They're just like, well, safe. they're safer with that. Yeah, that's well, how I, I should I, say I it. just think maintenance training is kind of an illusion, right? It's like right. I'm just training to maintain. It's like, well, maintain I'm what? Exactly. <laughs> like, what are you maintaining? Okay, you know? Because you're not going to be excited to go to the gym and maintain. I don't care what people say. Some people are going to be like, oh, I'm, I'm different. It's like, no, no, no. No, you're not. You're either focused on improving, and it doesn't necessarily have to mean lifting more. It could be you're improving your technique, like Steve Maxwell made a point where he's he's not trying to lift more than ever before, but now he's focused on the perfect push-up right. or the perfect squat. So there's still, there's still some factor he's trying to improve. There's some way of – there's some barometer for forward progress. So if you just do these mindless workouts like 99% of people do who go to the gym, they just go in there and put in time. They don't have any clear focus on what they're trying to do. There's no goal. They're not. Well, that's why they're on a treadmill on your cell phone. I mean, it's like, how's that even or possible? Or they're just sticking around. It's like, oh, I'm going to try it. And it's every once in a while, that's fun to do, right? Like you just go into a workout saying, hey, I'm just going to play around with some shit. I'm just right. going to try some different stuff. That's okay to do every once in a while. But those kind of workouts but, aren't going to get you to anything <laughs> exceptional or even excellent. You know, right. Not gonna happen. You, have to have, you have to have some idea. I mean, most of my workouts, I have a plan. And – it also keeps me focused so that I don't waste time in there. I hit right. those four moves and I'm out the fucking door. Right. I don't go in there and go, oh, well, maybe I'll do this. Oh, maybe I'll do that today. Okay, like, this looks cool. Like, like, no, I got, no, I've got stuff I to exactly do, man. Do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Even if I, even I just want to go home and recover, that's something for me to do. And so by me spending another hour or two in the gym is hindering my recovery that I need to go do later. Right. So I want to get I want to get to that. I actually want to get to the get to my house. Have my post-training meal and take my ass out on my terrace and smoke my cigar and relax. 
relax. Okay, I don't want to be sitting there putting that off because that's exactly. all part of my recovery. Okay, so. so it's diminishing returns after a while too, right? Yeah. So I mean, once once you've hit all the main things to hit, like for example, I, I went to the gym on Saturday mm-hmm. and did deadlifts, and then I did ring pull-ups, and then I did dragon flags, did some kettlebell mm-hmm. pressing at home, did some double swings there. That's about it, man. Mm-hmm. And the whole workout at the gym took about 45 minutes, yeah. stretch, joint mobility, I'm out the fucking door. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, other people are on their fifth bicep exercise, their fourth <laughs> chest exercise. I mean, how many bicep exercises do you need? <laughs> <laughs> I got I got to do these triplets for my biceps. I'm like, triplets? Really? <laughs> Come on, Well, man. I mean, also, why aren't weighted pull-ups or bent-over rows and overhead presses Hell, or, and four presses or things along these compound exercises, why aren't those enough? Exactly. You know, for the average person, they more than are. So oh, these yeah. people that focus on a lot of isolation exercises, they're not even getting the goal they're pursuing. You ever notice how most people doing a lot of curls don't have impressive arms? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to see anyone who can, let's say, bench press 300 pounds or do weighted pull-ups with a, a quarter of their body weight or overhead press at least their body weight or 80% of their body weight who don't have pretty impressive physiques. This right. is going to be this going to be a side effect of doing the big moves. You're not going to see someone with an impressive squat and deadlift who doesn't look like they can they're, they're, they have impressive squats and deadlifts. Right. So you can see people with an impressive bench press who surprise you. But with certainly <laughs> right. like when someone can deadlift 700 pounds, that's not going to be a surprise. You're going to look at the person and be like, "Yeah, I bet you can." <laughs> you know? right. Like when Mark Phillippe is like, "Yeah, I deadlifted 863." That's not hard to believe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? I'm like, "Yeah." There's <laughs> a look of power to it. You're not like, "Well, I need to see proof of that." <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, oh man. man. So yeah, cool. We can stuff, go ahead and wrap it up here. And one thing you guys can do, one obstacle a lot of you need to get over is <laughs> using that coupon code LLA to get 10% off some great products at MikeMahler.com and then over at your website too, man, right? Yeah, yeah over at NewWarriorTrain.com. Same thing, man. Use that. So, and then I know I realize there's an obstacle to leaving a review on iTunes <laughs> and Stitcher, but today, hey, guess what? Apply Ryan's knowledge today. <laughs> And go log into your iTunes account. Give us a review. Go log into Stitcher if that's how you listen to the show. Give us a review or post it on our podcast Facebook page. Hit us up on Twitter. Tell yeah. us how great you thought, thought the show was. All of those things help. Exactly. And if you one more obstacle of asking yourself, well, how else can I help? Well, hey, here's one obstacle you can remove. Go over to patreon.com slash LLA podcast. Become a monthly supporter of the show and remove that obstacle of that one dollar bill in that box that they put up there by default and add a zero. You know, add your contribution to that and put a zero behind that one or a few zeros or at least start by erasing the one and put a five in there like so many of our listeners have done so far. And there you go. And now you've removed that obstacle and you're supporting us. Yeah, I mean, you have to remove your head from your ass first. That's, that's another obstacle you may have. <laughs> so that's, that's one of those zeros. You take that, come out of that zero and put it on that board. Then when you become a supporter, it makes your life so much better right there, man. So there it's you go, like, folks. You know, one, of, one of the guys at the dog park was like, uh, hey, you know anything that will help me put more lead in my pencil? I'm like, the first <laughs> obstacle you need to worry about is removing your gawk. You, know, you need to see the pencil first. You know? I mean, for all you know, you can have plenty of lead in your pencil. You just can't see it. And you know, quit <laughs> referencing it as a pencil because that's not impressive. So, uh, no woman wants a pencil, okay, <laughs> or guy. You know, so an equal opportunity. Like, yeah, I'll put it out there for both sides, right there. There's nothing impressive about a pencil. <laughs> oh man. Oh, right, good folks. man. Thanks again. Take we'll care. Next time. All right, folks.